Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 62 of the Stroke Cast. You know, I have been very tired in April this year, and I think it's because I was very busy in March. You see, in March, I took two major trips that I'm going to talk about today. The Joko Cruise, which I mentioned a few weeks back in my interview with Robin Wilson Beatty, uh, and a trip to Pune, India, which I talked about in Facebook Live sometime in the last few weeks. This week, I have some more thoughts to share about both of these adventures. First of all, the Joko Cruise was as awesome as I expected. I've been on it, oh, I think uh, seven times now. Uh, this was the ninth cruise uh, total in this series. And, you know, it's something I'm, I'm already booked again for next year. Uh, I do sometimes worry that since I have such high expectations that it continues to meet, that I'm not walking away with the over-the-top over feelings of awesomeness that some people do. Uh, or maybe it's not about expectations. Maybe my affect is just a little bit flatter these days due to the combination of my stroke and medications. Regardless, it is still a fantastic time. This year, there appeared to be more folks on the boat with visible disabilities than in years past, and that is fantastic. I, I love seeing that that greater exposure and, and more people who are able to get out and go ahead and enjoy life and take advantage of this fantastic experience. And we have more folks with both visible and invisible disabilities at the meetup for folks with disabilities. In general, it's just a really positive environment filled with helpful, caring people. And if you like board games, nerdy things, or generally nerdy people, come on and join us next year. You can visit jococruise.com for more details. I did have uh, a few adventures, of course. Uh, for one thing, I had my first major fall since my stroke during the cruise. Uh, I actually fell down uh, on the ground in the British Virgin Islands, because if you're going to have a fall, you want to do it in a foreign country. What uh, actually happened is it wasn't really a balance issue for me. In, in my case, I, you know, I'd been walking around, it was hot and I was tired. And so I leaned against one of those concrete pillars you see in the parking lots. You know how a lot of times there'll be these concrete pillars that you can put in and out of a hole in the ground and lock in a place so that they can close off a particular entrance to a parking lot or a road uh, to prevent cars from getting through. Uh, so I leaned against one of those. Unfortunately, it wasn't one that actually was sunk into the ground. Instead, at this parking lot, they put just a small metal plate on the bottom of it. So what that means is that as soon as I leaned against it, it began to move and shift and fall backwards, taking me with it. It was really interesting because at first I was, you know, the whole fall probably took, you know, less than less than two seconds. But time just slows down drastically. And I spend the very first portion of that fall thinking, oh, no, let me try to recapture my balance. What is going on here? And trying to process all of that. And then I realize, nope. I am going down, nothing I can do about it. Uh, somehow or other, I managed to uh, spin myself or contort myself in such a way that uh, I ended up doing very minimal damage in, in the fall. I landed reasonably safely, protected my head, which is really what matters, protected the shoulder, which is still a little bit weak. Uh, and then, you know, before I knew it, I was on the ground. And, and that's that's fine, uh, so I begin recalling my fall recovery procedure from the hospital, which is the first thing they tell you to do is stop, take a moment, assess your condition, figure out what you need to do, then figure out a plan for getting up. And I was trying to do this. However, the very helpful locals were panicked to see me fall, uh, especially since the cane and the brace made it 
obvious that, uh, you know, I was already not in the best of shape. So they came rushing over and started grabbing my arms to try to help me up. You see, this is the problem because they don't know that I can't really use my left arm to help me get up. They don't know what condition my shoulder is in. They don't know what condition my legs are in. So they're just trying to pull me straight up. I was, you know, essentially on my back. So it took several people there to convince them to let me go and let me just do this on my own. Uh, as I then turned over, got into a crawling position so I could start to get my legs under me. And they're still trying to grab my arms to help me up, despite me saying, no, you don't need to help. I've got this. And other people saying it too. So, you know, eventually I, I did manage to get up the whole thing, you know, happened very quickly, but it seemed to take a lot longer. And this is the most important lesson and tip I have for folks who don't have disabilities, who are interested in helping people who do have disabilities. And that is this. It's great to offer assistance. It's very much appreciated. However, when a person with disabilities says no thank you or declines your assistance, believe them. If they say they don't need your help, trust that they know what they're doing. Those of us with disabilities, those of us who've been through this, we have a better idea of what our bodies are capable of and exactly what help we need and where, if you are going to grab us, you should grab us and where you should not. Especially as a stranger, you don't know. So offer assistance. If the person accepts it, fantastic. If the person declines it, believe them. That is one of the most important things and one of those tips I would encourage you to share with other people. When disabled people say they don't need help, trust them. So I got through the whole thing with some minor bumps and bruises and, well, a couple of pretty gnarly looking bruises, but, you know, no major, uh, no major challenges uh, resulting from that. The other big adventure I had uh, related to the disabilities was pushing my limits while walking, which was great because, you know, you don't grow unless you are challenging your limits. And I believe that if I don't occasionally fail, I'm probably not trying hard enough. I have actually been wondering lately if I still need to use my AFO, my ankle brace, when I walk. It turns out I do. This was not necessarily an intentional test. During the cruise, we had some fantastic concerts in uh, Puerto Rico, in San Juan, right at the port, and it rained. It was completely unexpected that it was going to rain, but it ended up with a torrential downpour. Really, just a small one right over the port in sort of the absolute worst possible place it could be for us. Anyway, long story short there, they had to cancel the last part of the concert, the They Might Be Giants show, and move all of that back onto the boat. And we had a rushed last minute concert on the boat, and it was uh, it was kind of an intense uh, evening, which resulted in me walking back to the ship in tremendous amounts of rain, along with everybody else, because I figured even though there was a courtesy shuttle for folks with disabilities, it was going to take me longer to wait for the shuttle, get in the shuttle, and then take that back. So I just walked uh, and I got soaked, as did everybody else. We uh, began referring to the whole thing as the Moisture Rico experience. Um, and so, yes, got soaked and my shoes got completely soaked. And while I did bring my sandals on the trip as well, the sandals don't accommodate the AFO. So I had to go ahead and spend that evening, the next day, and half of the next day without my AFO while my shoes dried. Uh, and it took them a while to dry because, you know, really wet. Um, my AFO was fine, but I just couldn't wear it until the shoes dried. So what that meant was that I was walking around, like I said, a day and a half without the, the brace on. And I figured I could do it. I mean, I do it at home all the time. I don't wear it around the house because, you know, there's plenty of walls and furniture and, you know, I'm taking very short steps at home, so I'm not really pushing it. And uh, it's certainly safe. What I found on the boat, though, was that, first of all, it, the boat was being very boaty, uh, meaning that it was, we did have some rocking on the uh, on the cruise ship, 
uh, and uh, with all the adventure that was certainly tiring. And I discovered just how much fatigue, you know, I can get from that sort of experience, from working that leg in a way that it really hasn't had to work very much. Um, it was working really hard. And by that next day and a half, my leg was just tired. And I found that as I was walking, my toes were actually dragging on the ground more. Uh, and that was an important lesson in that my AFO still significantly helps my walking. So it's not going away anytime soon, but I did learn some lessons and figure I can focus on developing the strength that I need. Great lesson learned, a great skill test, and really a lot of great practice. So those were the adventures on the, the Joko Cruise. Again, accessibility was, for the most part, fine. I didn't have any major issues with that. Um, you know, other than, you know, the space is so small that you end up with some challenges where they are unintentionally pitting some uh, folks with disabilities against other folks with disabilities because you've got cabins that are super small and don't really have room to store a wheelchair or a motorized cart. So some folks have to leave those out in the halls and the halls are very narrow, which means those of us who walk with a cane or folks who walk with crutches or a walker have a lot more trouble now walking around the halls. Uh, and you really hate to see that kind of situation evolve. So that's sort of an ongoing challenge that uh, the boats and folks are just going to have to deal with. But as I said, jococruise.com, if you want more information, it's a fantastic experience. I also took a trip to India. Uh, and that was uh, another adventure in and of itself. And that whole thing was a fascinating experience. I was just sort of amazed much of the time. Uh, it was a business trip, so I was there to do some work for uh, for a company. So I guess technically I can call myself now an international business consultant, which is a lot of words to put on a business card. Uh, the trip there took about 35 hours, and the trip back took about 41 hours. Uh, fortunately, my superpower is being able to sleep on airplanes. I developed that about 10, 15 years ago, and that's something that has served me quite well on these long flights. So I want to talk about sort of the general experience first, and that's that I found that the people I encountered uh, in Pune, India, were all just super helpful. Um, everybody was willing to help me out in any way they could, and I'm not sure exactly why. I mean, uh, it's I'm sure it's the combination of things, me being quote-unquote the talent for the project I was involved in, uh, me simply being a foreign business person or me being a person with disabilities. I'm sure that was a whole combination of things that contributed to the, the treatment uh, I got and how quickly people were jumping at the opportunity to provide some level of service uh, for me. Uh, at one point, I was in the lobby of the hotel and dropped my cane. Uh, as I started bending over to pick it up, Somebody, uh, a member of the staff, literally ran over to pick it up for me. Uh, I also found myself struggling to open doors because every time I, I went to open a door, somebody would rush ahead to open the door for me. Uh, I had folks who were insisting on carrying my backpack for me between the office and the car that was taking me back and forth. At the hotel buffet, I managed to get table service. Those folks just kept asking me what I would like from the buffet as they went over to bring things to me. Uh, and, I, you know, this is seems like it was only partially due to my my visible disabilities. It, feel, it felt like, in some respects, that there was sort of a strong, not service culture, but servant culture uh, at play, which was... A bit disconcerting, uh, but what was even more disconcerting was just how quickly I managed to adapt to it and to get comfortable with that environment. So that's something that's going to require a lot more thinking about on my part and, you know, trying to understand the culture in general. Uh, in my discussions with other folks there, uh, they also seem to have a large um, make work program. So lots of folks who are doing jobs because there was an incentive to just create jobs for people to do 
that uh, that probably could have been done by other folks. But, you know, it's it's how uh, that society is is being built right now, apparently. And again, I just saw a very small portion of it. Uh, so uh, very limited experience, but those are just some of those observations I've had. Several folks have asked me about accessibility in Pune, India. Uh, and I don't think it was awesome. Now, granted, again, my limited experience, I didn't really face that many challenges because I had a car picking me up every day at the hotel, taking me to the office, and then taking me back at the end of the day. Folks were ordering food in for lunch, and, you know, there were certainly plenty of dinner options at the hotel, and, you know, I I never had any challenges. I was never really out on the street uh, on my own trying to navigate, trying to get by the simply wasn't part of my experience. What I could see of the streets uh, from the the, the cabs taking me places was that they didn't appear to be very wheelchair friendly. The sort of difference between the sidewalk and the street was sometimes a pretty fuzzy distinction. You would have scooters and motorcycles just sort of jumping up onto the sidewalk to bypass. Uh, There were plenty of really tall curbs and No obvious curb cuts that I saw. Crossing the street is largely an affair in jaywalking uh, and people just sort of going and the cars stopping for them sometimes. But fortunately, the cars do move at a rather slow pace. Um, You know, crossing the street is probably not something most folks who didn't grow up in the culture would be comfortable with doing there. Uh, wheel, you know, trying to cross the street in a wheelchair, I think could be really challenging due to, um, just the lower height for cars. Lanes were sort of a suggestion. There are plenty of large uncontrolled intersections with cars sometimes coming at each other head on, but I don't mean to imply that the drivers are bad because really what I saw from the cars was a different etiquette of driving, a different concept of the rules of the road, a different system. And while a rogue American driver in that mix would be uh, an absolute disaster, a, uh, you know, one of those local drivers on, on streets in the United States applying those same rules would probably be a disaster. But when everybody in the area is playing by the same rules, it's a system that that works, that people are able to get by, that people know what to expect. The other thing that's different is uh, folks are blowing their horns all the time, but it's not in the sort of American style of get the heck out of my way. It's more of a I'm here notice. Um, You know, cars are driving around. It's not just a visual navigation. It really is an audio navigation uh, with horns being tooted to let people know that you're passing, that you're on the side, that you're behind them, that you're doing something. It really is a method of communicating intentions and awareness to other drivers, which also makes me think that driving in Pune, India is probably a heck of a lot more challenging for folks who may be hard of hearing and not able to hear those horns. Uh, than it is in the U.S. for that specific reason, is that it is a strong component of audio data that is given to the drivers and was, again, fascinating to see. So let's talk about the important thing, the bathrooms. What I found was that there weren't that many handicapped stalls. Uh, They just really weren't a ton of them. Uh, you find them in the airport, uh, and in general, you know, a lot of them may have been smaller. Most of the stalls did feature sit-down toilets. The airport did also offer some of the squat variety. So whichever system you are more comfortable with is is available there. Um, toilet paper is going to be a maybe. What was present in each of those stalls was a hose, uh, not unlike the hose that in the United States you find on the kitchen sink in many kitchens. And that was a feature of many of those 
many of those stalls. So that is certainly an option for performing cleanup. It's probably not necessarily a skill you want to acquire the very first time you need it. Uh, what I also found was that, you know, at the airports especially, uh, a lot of folks used the hose, had perhaps very poor direction because the floors ended up just absolutely soaked, which is why the um, – the, the men's room at the Mumbai airport actually has an attendant there the whole time mopping and cleaning and just just taking care of things. So in general, if uh, toilet paper is something that you find yourself regularly using, you may want to make sure you keep a spare roll with you just in case. I also found that elevators were a bit of a challenge as well. I mean, they worked fine for me. Uh, but the ele- money of the elevators I rode in were very small. There was certainly no room to for a wheelchair to turn around in many of those elevators. In terms of general acceptance, I would say that you know people generally didn't ask about uh, my disabilities. They uh, when the topic would come up in conversation and I would raise it, folks would generally um, appear to change the subject. Now, I don't know how much of that is courtesy versus how much of it is sort of a stigma associated with disabilities. But, you know, that was, again, just my experience with uh, with a few people. One of the things that did stand out to me, and again, limited experience watching out the car on as we're driving places and looking around at folks in the office, is that I did not see anyone else outside of the airport with a visible disability. None. Now, I don't know if that's because disabilities are super rare in India, or if folks with disabilities are just really well taken care of, or if it's too challenging to leave the home, or if there's, you know, that much shorter life expectancy, or if it's just a tremendous stigma around disability that keeps people from being out in public. But, um, you know, I don't know the reason, but I just really didn't see anyone else with those visible disabilities out there. Uh, in terms of the airport, I did have wheelchair assistance at the Mumbai airport. Uh, the chair folks were fairly insistent when they saw me, so I accepted their help. I figured it's going to help with security. And it did. Getting the wheelchair assistance meant that not only didn't I have to walk, uh, I was able to be bumped to the head of several of the lines, which was really nice. Uh, security was an interesting experience. Uh, my AFO did result in a private screening, uh, as I'm trying to explain to somebody that it is not a prosthetic, it is a brace. Uh, and then, you know, the security guy actually led me away to a private area so he could check it out, uh, which that was the other interesting thing was he grabbed my left arm to guide me there. And I'm uh, about to object to the assistance he's providing because I don't need it. And then I realized, no, I don't think he's providing assistance in this case. I think he's providing restraint in this case. Uh, they seem very serious. Uh, my CPAP machine also did cause a lot of confusion for the security folks as well. So I guess they don't see a ton of CPAP machines at the Mumbai airport. Uh, it also is an airport where all the electronics have to come out. Every uh, tablet and Kindle and computer and CPAP machine and podcast recording gear, all of that has to come out of your bag to be screened separately. And that's one of those challenges with working with the wheelchair assistance folks, because they are trying to be fast and they will help or try to help but they don't know everything that's in your bag or where it is or where it goes. So it ends up becoming a a clumsy type of thing. Uh, I'm an experienced traveler, so I could probably clear my bag heck of a lot faster than they can or that I can with their assistance, but their assistance is there. Also, the screening process meant that at times I was not in immediate contact with my belongings and I could not see them the whole time, uh, which is frustrating and it's something that's not supposed to happen, but you know, when you're traveling with disabilities, that is something that's going to happen. So regardless, the uh, we got all, got everything repacked. The chair pusher dropped me at the gate. And then I let, went and did some shopping and took care of some other stuff. And then he came back looking for me because it was time to take me for the second screening. And this is 
apparently, I think this is probably a requirement by the U.S., is that all everybody going to getting on the plane had to go through an entire screening process again. That really duplicated what we had already been through to get to the gates. This was after this was at the gate and then you go into a separate holding pen until you can actually go ahead and get on the plane. Now, this time it was all shoes had to come off. So this is where things get a little interesting because my AFO, of course, is mounted in my shoe, as we've already covered. And so there's a row of those airport seats, which have the arms between each seat. So you don't touch your fellow passengers that you don't know, which is great. Um, gentleman saw me and got up to offer me his chair. And I declined because, you know, it wasn't really going to work for me. Uh, and then I sat down on the floor because there are no couches or anything for me to use. And a woman got really annoyed at me because and she was like, that guy just offered you a seat. You should just take it. And uh, then, of course, I have to explain that, no, I can't because with those arms between each of those seats, I can't actually get my leg in the position to take off my shoe with the AFO. Uh, so that was a little something. I think part of that was folks are embarrassed to see somebody with disabilities who has to go ahead and sit on the floor in order to accommodate the security procedures, uh, which, you know, you do what you got to do to get it done. So I did that, took off the shoes, got through security, I uh, sat down on the floor again to put my shoes back on, managed that whole thing, and then, you know, ended up on the airplane. Uh, again, it was another case where all the electronics had to come out and, you know, be screened again, and then I have to try and get everything back in in just the right way. So it, it's a challenge, but, you know, it's, it's a thing. Uh, from there, our plane took off from Mumbai. We had a fuel stop in Frankfurt, Germany, and then we continued on to Newark, where I, again, had wheelchair assistance to meet the plane. I normally don't use wheelchair assistance, uh, well, at any of the airports, but especially domestic for domestic travel. But, you know, I figured, again, this will probably help us clear customs, um, and it probably is just going to make a lot more sense for that. So... The wheelchair was waiting for me there, and along with a whole bunch of other wheelchair pushers. And I was one of the last people off the plane, and that was when it was announced that this was a miracle flight, or that's what the wheelchair pushers referred to it as, because there were probably 10 of them there waiting for passengers, and most of those passengers did not need the wheelchairs, so apparently everybody was healed on the plane, which is awesome if that happens. But uh, so they joke about that, which is, again, fine. What was a little more annoying about the experience was that, really, I wasn't a passenger in this case. I wasn't a client. I was cargo. Uh, and my pusher, she was very professional and and, and whatnot. Uh, but I ended up having to wait in a line behind a whole bunch of empty wheelchairs to get into the elevator. Because apparently there's not really that much distinction between the empty wheelchairs with the pushers and the pusher who actually has a, a client in, in their wheelchair. Uh, and while well, the pushers are busy joking and chatting with one another, there was no joking and chatting with the passengers outside of the, the functional stuff. So, I mean, that was sort of a different type of experience, which wasn't, uh, wasn't awesome, but we got through immigration fairly quickly, got through customs fairly quickly. And then again, it's back to dealing with TSA. And of course, you know, my perspective is, 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 filtered through my general despising of the TSA. Uh, again, it's one of those things where you can't watch your stuff. You can't keep track of it. The assistance is, again, trying to help you clear your stuff, get your bag empty, get stuff back through, and manage all that. And so it's just generally super annoying process. But we get through that, get to the gate, and then I'm able to thank the pusher for their assistance, and they go on their way, and I go ahead and get a hearty breakfast. Uh, from there, two more flights are waiting for me. So I got to fly from Newark to O'Hare and then change planes in O'Hare for Seattle. At both O'Hare and Seattle, because of the way uh, the folks in India set it up, I had wheelchair assistants waiting for me in the jetways, which I declined uh, at that time, thanked the pusher for being there and went on my way. So I guess I contributed to my own part in a miracle flight in that experience. So overall, the wheelchair assistance, definitely worth it in India. 
Uh, not so much for most of the domestic stuff, although for customs and immigration, it was nice. Overall, the whole thing was a fascinating experience. Uh, I had a great time over the course of March, learned a lot, did a lot, experienced a lot. And I think the, the whole point here is that I am not going to let this stroke stop me from having even more adventures in the future. And that brings us to our hack of the week. And this week's hack comes to us from one-handed lady golfer, Gianna Rojas. Well, you know, the other thing that gives me a challenge is necklaces. Um, there's uh, two little magnetic um, ends that you can swap out your clips, uh, your hook and clip for. And it just, it's magnetic. Because I'm one-handed, it's probably easier to go to a jewel. No, but they do make these little things where you can just, uh, you don't even have to take the other clips off. You could just hang, hang the, it's a little, uh, just, you know, all my necklaces. I have, I have, uh, I added a little, um, uh, the, the little magnet thing. It's two-sided magnet. And so basically I just have to get it behind my neck and it already snaps together. You can hear more from Gianna at strokecast.com slash golf. So what has your experience of travel with disabilities been like? Go ahead and share your thoughts over at strokecast.com slash travel. Share this episode with a friend, colleague, or relative by, again, giving them the link, strokecast.com slash travel. And make sure you subscribe for free in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode of Strokecast. And of course, as always, don't get best get better. Thanks for listening. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you soon. The Stroke Cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Strokecast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network.